That was the sky last night in North Texas. How can we not use that clip? Well, one other way we can look at that is with the soundings. This is the same cloud mass indicated by this higher relative humidity. The moisture and the temperature lines, they're very close together, indicating that there's considerable humidity there, unlike the lower layers that are dry because of the large distance between those two plots. So these cloud bases are up there at about 25,000 feet. Not quite as pretty as the opening clip, but that gives you an idea of what it looks like on the scooty. So let's head right to that surface map. Yeah, we are seeing a change in the weather pattern. Looking at the thickness lines, the red and blue dashed plots, you can see that there's much lower values up to the north. That's indicative of very rich and deep cold air up there in Canada, starting to come south across the northern plains and across the northeastern U.S. Ahead of this system in the Great Lakes area, we've got some very mild warm air advection, enough to produce some of this snow and a lot of the clouds there around Michigan and Wisconsin. A series of fronts through the central U.S. extending from North Carolina out towards St. Louis back to the central Rockies and up into California. And with the pattern becoming more warm and moist, we are seeing the dry line reestablish itself in Texas. That's how it looks. Not very obvious. The drier air is back to the west right here, and we're seeing mostly mid and upper level cloud. So really no reflection at the surface of the dry line. However, we can put the plots on there. That's one way of doing it. Dew points rising from 44 around Sweetwater up to the 60s in Dallas. And of course, another way we can do that is to plot the isodrosotherms. This is very smoothed, so I would really not use this in an analysis. I would want more of a fine-grained appearance, but roughly the dry line is located right there. Returning to our surface map, it's probably about time to bust out the cross sections. Let's do that. Let's go from this tropical air 70s with 60s dew points in East Texas across this frontal zone and into the cold air in Canada. Let's go to Weather Nerds. That's a good site for that. So there's our GFS plots. We need to make sure that we're looking at the correct valid time. So we're going to have to kick that up to about the nine hour point. So there it is, nine hours. And so we go to this cross-section mode right here and draw a line. And we get the cross-section. Now the first thing we have to do is orient ourselves. A is at the top, B is at the bottom. So we're going from Canada to Texas. So what are we looking at? Well, we check the top there. This is a plot of wind speed and theta. In other words, potential temperature, that's basically the temperature, normalized to 1,000 millibars, close to sea level. And I like to think of potential temperatures as blankets on a bed. The blankets bump up over cold air, like you see here in Canada. And that's because, for one thing, potential temperature always rises with height. It's never going to fall with height because that would result in spontaneous overturning. That creates a very unstable profile, and that does not happen in the atmosphere. So the colder readings, 271 Kelvin, there it is right there, rising to warmer values out there in the tropics. Likewise, it rises with height to higher values, because if we drop these readings down to sea level, you would get compression and 
strong warming, and it would rise up into the hundreds and 110, 120 degrees. And that's the normal state of the atmosphere. So what's important here is where we have packing in the vertical, that's indicating a stable layer or decreased instability. And that's probably the frontal inversion. Let me draw that out for you. That right there is likely the frontal inversion. So it looks like we're picking up a boundary out here around Oklahoma, rising up to higher heights across the Dakotas, and then up in Canada, the frontal inversion is way up there at about 20,000 feet. And you can see how this jet stream lies right above it. Now, there are different fields that we can look at in the upper levels. Sometimes we don't want to look at wind speed. Well, we can look at relative humidity. And that kind of reflects that frontal transition zone right there. Some of the clouds right there within that frontal transition zone. And we can kind of see some of the higher cirrus up there across Texas. And I forgot to point out, yeah, we can see the tropopause right there. Notice how it's very stable up above that. That's the stratosphere. So we're actually seeing a couple features right there. What else can we look at? Well, certainly vertical velocity. You can pick any of those values. And this shows rather extensive area of downward motion. And the units are in pascals per second. So when those are positive, like on the blue part of the scale right there, that's moving towards higher values, which means we're descending. And then out ahead of it, we can see kind of a very vague area of lift. I don't get too much into nitpicking these exact locations because this is very difficult for the model to compute. What I tend to look at is the overall patterns. And this is indicating strong downward motion across the Canadian-U.S. border. So that's in this area right here. Back to our surface map, we can see that the cold air coming south is not really all that cold. I mean, we're talking 30s in North Dakota, and that's what we should be seeing this time of year. Let's take a look out in the Pacific. Things do seem to be quieting down in that region. We've got one little storm system way off the coast of Oregon there, and then heading up into Alaska. Now we're seeing some definite indications of winter up here in Arctic air mass, 1044 millibars, centered on Dawson, Yukon, and temperatures minus 45 at Fort Yukon, minus 44 at Old Crow. And there you go, that's what minus 45 looks like. Live camera from Fort Yukon. The sun very low to the southern horizon because they're up near the Arctic Circle, so the sun is just not going to get very high in the sky during the day. And there's Eagle, Alaska, currently minus 42 Fahrenheit. Remember, that's without the windshield. I don't get into, into windshields. I like to deal with absolute values of temperature. Yep, little truck right there on the road. And you can see some of that ice fog across the valleys. Now, last time I looked, it didn't look like any of this Arctic air was going to come very far south. The pattern is keeping it locked up there in Canada. And you can see that there is great extent of this hybrid Arctic continental polar air mass all the way into Nunavut. Temperatures up there in the minus 20 range with some significant wind. Now, there is kind of like a little Alberta Clipper, Hudson Bay Clipper, if you want to call it that. That is probably heading more towards Quebec. We're going to take a look at the model plots and see what that's going to do. And then just to look out there in the Atlantic. Pretty quiet. However, in Newfoundland, powerful system there. And you can see that the temperatures up there at 52 do point at 50. So a lot of tropical air has certainly advected northward. On the west side, though, 
snow squalls across Quebec down to Montreal and Maine, and temperatures not terribly cold, but certainly wintry. A quick check of temperature records for this afternoon. These are forecast highs. We're going to be tying the record at Midland and Roswell, out there in far west Texas and New Mexico. Greenville, South Carolina, expected to break the record, set in 1956. And Atlanta, tying the record of 74, set in 2012. Here's how we're looking for Saturday. Continued warm in the southeastern U.S. and fairly mild conditions out there in the Great Basin and Central Rockies. More of the same on Sunday across the southern states. Then on Monday, a cold front will be moving through the central U.S., clearing out that warm weather, but still hanging on to warm conditions in the southwestern U.S. and along the eastern Atlantic coast. And I've only been looking at forecast highs. There's nothing to show for forecast lows. No records being broken pretty much over the past two weeks. We are definitely in a warm pattern across much of the U.S. Let's head into that forecast. This is how things looked uh, last night. I need to fix that. Yeah, be careful. Make sure you're looking at the correct model. So that's how it looks. The main frontal boundary down to the south. You probably remember that from the surface analysis. So we'll launch that forward into the weekend. Things are really dry across much of the country, but some precip starting in northeast Texas with this warm air advection. You can see that little bear clinic low right there in Texas with a front kind of like that. Some showers do get going tomorrow morning across Arkansas and Mississippi, and then we can see things get kind of unsettled in the Pacific Northwest. A couple waves working over that front, kind of training west to east like that, some isentropic lift, good humidity, and that produces kind of a mix of rain and snow depending on the elevation, and a lot of that moves into Montana and Wyoming. That wave starts moving out to the plains on Sunday. That's it right there. This should be a good push of cold air advection into the plains. There it goes, rocketing southward. Some storms do get going in Arkansas, Kentucky, right there. Now the Gulf is open. That's helping to feed that convective activity. So it could be kind of an unsettled pattern across the Mississippi River Basin. Sunday night. So that'll be something we'll need to keep an eye on. So it looks like we do get this strong incursion of cold air. And also, with the wraparound across the Great Lakes into Ontario, that's the deformation zone right there. That can be a potent area for heavy snow. And I think we're seeing that in the Lake Superior area Sunday night into Monday. Blustery and very cold across the Great Lakes for Monday. Cool in Texas and Oklahoma, Arkansas. Some of that fresh cold air coming south, returning us to seasonal levels. And it looks like a lot of that cold air pushes very strongly into New Mexico and the Big Bend area. So we may see some of those canyon winds developing in New Mexico. The weather deteriorating once again in the Pacific Northwest for Monday due to that system right there. Looks like it's fast moving, but some intense vertical motion fields with that. Going into Tuesday, things moderate across much of the southeastern U.S., but we're dealing with this new system coming out of the Rockies, and you can see some of that snow there in Utah and the mountains of Colorado. Warm air advection wing gets going once again on Wednesday across the southeastern states. Kind of a warm front and cold front set up there in Texas, helping to support that. Maybe a weak low-level jet across that region. And then we get another incursion of cold air during the middle of the week. And looks like another system coming through the northwestern U.S. around Thursday. And look at that, a southern stream system through Nevada. 
the jet running something like that, and the frontal boundaries probably like that. So this could paint the potential for some heavy snow in Nevada and Utah for Thursday night into Friday. And then that'll move through Colorado, New Mexico, and into the Central Plains, and not much of an impact until Sunday for Texas and Oklahoma. That looks like a pretty good chunk of cold air coming down. We do have to be careful because we're 200 hours out. The GFS does have a cold bias. 200 hours, that's probably within the window of reason. It's usually 300 hours where things go out the window. But uh, this does paint a very cold picture for the 12th and 13th. And we'll just have to see how that evolves next week. And that's all I have for your Friday edition. I've got a roofer coming out here in about 30 minutes. I need to get this packed up and uploaded. And hopefully that way you'll have faster access to today's program. I want to thank our many Patreon supporters, people like Peter Belinkett, James Rout, Nick Hodson, Philip Haley, Daniel Park. All of you people help keep this program going, and I thank you. Anyway, I hope you all have a great weekend. Take care, and we will see you Monday for the supporters and Wednesday for everybody else. Bye-bye.